is after nine o'clock East Coast. Um, this to say to everyone who is joining us from the various places uh, that you may be and are joining us um, on behalf of my colleagues at the LA Bay Book Company, which is located on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle, we are honored to be presenting this program this evening with US Congressman Adam Schiff for his extraordinary new book, Midnight in Washington, and it, uh, for which the subtitle is uh, as important and not always, this is not always the case with books, but Midnight in Washington, how we almost lost our democracy and still could. He is joining us from Washington. He, um, this is his first book and sometimes books by public figures such as um, Congressman Schiff are you know this sort of chronicle of their lives and what all they've you know got, what are the various things that have gotten them where they are. We hope he will write that book someday um, mm -hmm. because he's a marvelous and tremendous writer as this book reflects. Uh, but the book, this book is not this this book is very important and very timely and um, very few people are, have been in a position to write such a book um, because of the places um, Representative Schiff has been in as a chair of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, especially during the last um, period while he was, a, he was a, in the minority uh, for a few years, but um, as, as the chair um, of that once the Democratic Party had the majority in the House, um, through which, uh, but in both sides, so he's, as, as the, as when they're a minority as well, the majority um, played an invaluable, important role in, in the Congress itself and in, um, conveying to the U.S. public um, what all has been going on and what is at stake. This book amplifies and deepens that. And um, we're, we're, you know, it is, a, and it's, it is a book and yet it's got still unfolding stories um, as I think this evening's conversation will, will um, help reveal. I mean, it's, this is a book to read. And I will say the book has been out um, over a week and it's already getting the reaction where someone has bought it and come back and said they're buying another one to get someone else. It, this, this said this is th the real thing. Um, the book has now made the number one position on the New York Times bestseller list, which again I don't think it did when it first came out, but it, it's it was it was up there. But I think the the reaction um, that readers have really been getting, which is what really puts books in people's hands, and in this case um, necessary information in people's hands, um, and um, it's it's heartening to see that being felt and and. Um, taken to heart. Um, so, Mr. Chairman of the of, of the shift will be in conversation tonight with someone else who's we're delighted to have with us, John Meacham, um, who is a, a distinguished author, a Pulitzer Prize winning author of books, a longtime journalist. Um, we recounted he had a he had a role in uh, book publishing, but he also certainly has been an editor um, at Time and in, I believe Newsweek before that, and he's with us from Nashville, where he's um, the Rogers Chair in the American Presidency at Vanderbilt University. And he's the author of, a, I believe, nine books, author or editor, many of them presidential biographies. But his most recent book, um, which came out uh, last year, is this beautiful, eloquent testimony to uh, the late John Lewis, Representative John Lewis, uh, this book, His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope. Um, Congressman Schiff and, and Mr. Meacham will have a conversation. We hope you'll put questions in the Q&A portal in the, in the, uh, uh, on your screen. And later in their, their conversation, uh, they will, um, uh, Mr. Meacham will work those questions in. Adam Schiff, Congressman Schiff, um, represents California's 28th district. We won't say too much because there's been, you've already been talking about which baseball team he's representing mm -hmm. uh, here in the, Postseason, um, I will say this book is very serious in all sorts of ways, and as I've said, it's his his first book. But if you read the acknowledgments, along with all the acknowledgments to um, people, other, his people he serves with in Congress, um, people who's worked with him in his offices in um, Washington and in California, and his constituents and many others, he, he can say he he uh, uh, mentions that this is his first book, but like anyone else virtually from Los Angeles, he's taken his hand at screenplays. So um, he, uh, this maybe maybe there's movies yet to see from his hand. Um, before serving in Congress for the 28th district, he was a former U.S. 
attorney, which also I think um, informs this book and as well as a California state senator. Um, so we again, thank you all for joining us and I will now disappear and come back at the end. So ask you to all give good virtual attention and applause and gratitude to um, Congressman Adam Schiff and John Meacham. Thank you both gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, I like to point out that I was called distinguished, Mr. Chairman, so just so you know that, so you can get to respect <laughs> your tone. Um, I got to take what I can get here. Uh, we will not, I will pledge to you all, uh, the Congressman, all politics is local, as Speaker O'Neill taught us, and uh, his district abuts Dodger Stadium. Uh, I will refrain from sharing uh, how uh, the Atlanta Braves from down the road are doing tonight for those of you who are toggling between um, actual sport and uh, this contest we're in for, for democracy itself. But an honor to be here uh, with you. I had the pleasure of reading an early copy of, of this book. And as, as was just noted, I think with great delicacy, being sent a book by a politician is, is not the thing you wake up in the morning and really want to have happen to you uh, for, for various reasons. Uh, but this was a, a great pleasure to read and an important book. And I'm delighted to see uh, that it's receiving uh, the uh, hearing that it's clearly getting around the country. For those of you who may not have seen it, um, uh, Jonathan Martin, uh, my friend and, and longtime colleague, uh, wrote, I think, a very uh, very positive and very interesting review of the book uh, today or yesterday in the New York Times, which I, I commend uh, to you. Mr. Chairman, I'm just going to uh, throw some batting practice your way, uh, but I'm curious, um, did you know uh, President Trump was going to be the threat that he emerged, as he emerged, that is in 2015, 2016, uh, a lot of people saw him as a carnival barker, uh, saw him as something of an aberration. You know, we can we can buckle our seatbelts and get through this. Uh, did you when a did you share that more benign view, if I may? And then at what point did you begin to see him as a genuine threat to the constitutional order? Uh, well, John, uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for moderating the discussion tonight. Uh, I'm such an enormous fan. It's uh, going to be difficult for me to restrain myself from going all fanboy uh, during the course of the <laughs> evening, but I really so admire your work and, uh, and, and I'm delighted to, I feel like I'm in your study tonight. Um, <laughs> anytime, anytime. Um, you know, I used to tell a joke during the 2015 campaign when I was out on the stump and I was a, a surrogate for Hillary. Um, I would say that there's no way that Donald Trump is going to become the Republican nominee. This was before the end of the primaries. Uh, and I said, for two reasons. Uh, the first is Republicans aren't that suicidal. Uh, and the second is Democrats aren't that lucky. Um, well, it, it turns out uh, they, they were that suicidal um, and we weren't <laughs> that lucky. Um, I never imagined that, uh, that Donald Trump could get elected um, because I did view him as this kind of clownish figure, uh, this uh, carnival barker uh, and essentially a grifter. Um, and I didn't think the American people would go for that. Um, in terms of when I realized that it was much worse than I expected, um, it was early in the first year of his presidency. So I think just a few months in, because he didn't seem to have any apparent ideology. I thought, you know, it was entirely possible that he was just being a showman during the campaign and, uh, and not having a fixed ideology. He might uh, tend to uh, not be a partisan figure and maybe all over the map. But, uh, but it, it, it soon became apparent that he either couldn't tell uh, fact from fiction um, or he was willing to be uh, you know, engaged in falsehood after falsehood after falsehood. Uh, and, uh, and I remember uh, early in the first year when in our committee, we were charged with investigating what the Russians had done to interfere in our democracy and what they were doing still reaching what now seems like a self-evident conclusion, but at the time was a kind of a startling one, which was that the threat to our democracy no longer came predominantly from outside the country. It came from within, um, as 
we saw him, you know, batter democratic norm after democratic norm. So I have to say very early in the Trump administration, but not as early as many who knew that uh, from well before his election. Does that reflect uh, the conversation, say, within the Democratic caucus, within the circles uh, in which you moved? Was that, was that a common evolution, do you think? I think it was, with, with one very notable exception. My New York colleagues knew exactly who he was uh-huh. and what he represented. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, I, I couldn't fail but, you know, hear from every New Yorker, frankly, not just my colleagues, um, that uh, any New Yorker would tell you, they would say to me, that the man is a complete con um, and uh, he, he's going to be an unmitigated disaster. And indeed he was. So New Yorkers understood him very well. Uh, mm-hmm. The rest of the country did not. Uh, and, you know, of, of all the arguments that he made um, during that 2016 campaign, the one that concerned me the most uh, was the one I think that resonated the most, which was the argument he made to the ones he called the forgotten people in flyover country um, who had been you know, toiling their whole life, had nothing set aside for retirement. They were gonna have to work till they dropped. Uh, their kids, if they were lucky enough to go to college, um, were in debt and had no jobs when they got out. Uh, and you know, he said that uh, he was gonna help their lot. Uh, now he didn't, but, but nonetheless, these folks had had a Clinton as president, they had a Bush as president, Um, Their life had not appreciably changed, and they were ready to vote for someone who was willing to break everything. And that was not an irrational choice. Um, uh, So I understood at one level how people voted in 2016. It was much harder for me four years later to understand, after seeing what he represented, why so many continued to vote for him. So your your title is intriguing. Uh, And democracies, as you know better than I do, as an as a, uh, architect of where we are now, uh, and a, someone in the arena, democracies often are far more reflective of who we are than formative of who we are. Uh, politicians tend to be mirrors rather than makers, you know, put another way. Give us your analysis, if you would, of how the, we got, we've come so close to the midnight hour. You, you just alluded to it uh, about uh, so many folks over the last 30 or 40 years who have felt that uh, the, the covenant of America, the, the notion that if you worked hard, you would be rewarded, tomorrow would be better than today, that fundamental uh, began with Jefferson, that politics of optimism turned out not to be as durable uh, as, as a lot of us uh, would have hoped. Uh, but lay out, if you would, uh, 2015, uh, Trump steps into the race. I remember being, I, I think I'm right about this, uh, the same day or two that he announced at Trump Tower, Jeb Bush was in New York doing the late night shows. Uh, it looked as though we were heading toward possibly a, you know, a, as you alluded to, another Bush-Clinton race. Uh, as a kind of establishment Game of Thrones, uh, if, if you will. Uh, what are the forces, both in the country, and then what's your analysis of Trump himself that pushed us to this dark hour? Well, uh, you're, you're exactly right. I remember at that time thinking that uh, um, that Bush represented by far, Jeb Bush represented by far the strongest candidate in the Republican primary, he was the one that I was rooting for to fail um, yeah. because he would be so formidable. Um, so why was it that he ended up getting, I don't know, what was it, one, two, three percent of the vote? Um, I, I think there were a couple really revolutionary forces operating um, that uh, you know began their, their uh, churn decades uh, previously, but really reached their culmination uh, at this time. The first were these dramatic changes in the economy uh, akin to another industrial revolution, uh, the globalization of the economy, the automation of the economy, the fact that millions of people at home and, and billions of people around the world uh, were suddenly at risk of losing what they had. Um, and I think uh, often you see a truly kind of revolutionary forces, not among those who are most impoverished, but among those who, who suddenly have something to lose. 
Uh, and the fear of losing that can be extraordinarily potent. Uh, and because of these uh, remarkable changes in the economy, suddenly people in the middle class were at risk of falling out. Um, at the same time, we had a revolution in communication, um, which uh, unlike the printing press, uh, we only had uh, you know, relative mini you know, milliseconds to get used to. Uh, a medium in which lies travel far faster than truths and fear and anger go viral. Uh, and you, you take these forces and you put them together and I think they produce the kind of xenophobic populism that was already careening around the world, uh, giving rise to uh, Orban in Hungary and the far right parties in Poland and Germany in Vienna and France. Uh, we would see uh, thereafter the rise of autocrats uh, in places like the Philippines and Brazil. Uh, we would see Turkey's Erdogan increasingly uh, autocratic, Al-Sisi in Egypt. Uh, and so uh, I think that this combination of uh, immense economic anxiety uh, and a new information environment in which fear can travel so quickly and find like-minded people um, produce you know, a rare uh, and hospitable environment for the kind of ugly nativism uh, that is represented by Donald Trump. Um, it's not, I think, a, a mystery why Brexit preceded Trump. It was the same forces, you know, the same forces actually, ironically, in Russia who were meddling uh, in Brexit, but, but more importantly, the same global phenomena. Um, now, the other point that you make, I think, though, is exactly right also. And that is, okay, given that these were the global forces at play, um, once he was elected, why didn't our elected representatives defend their own institutions? Um, and, and here I quote one of your colleagues, Robert Caro, uh, who said in an interview that power doesn't corrupt as much as it reveals. And it doesn't always reveal us for our best, but it reveals a lot about who we are. And I would learn that a lot of the people I served with who I respected and admired because I believed that they believed what they were saying uh, turned out not to believe it at all. Or if they did, none of it was quite so important as maintaining their own position or maybe getting a new position uh, in a Trump administration. Yeah. Put on your philosophical hat for a second, um, your wizard's cap, uh, if you would, about democracy itself. Um, let me give you a, uh, a, a statement to, uh, a, on the old phrase of the college exam, assess the validity of the statement. <laughs> uh, democracy is the, one of the most counterintuitive undertakings in human experience. It depends on our seeing each other as neighbors and not as reflexive adversaries and puts a premium on the capacity to sacrifice immediate interest for midterm and long term gain. Is that are you on board with that? I am. I am. So are the forces, the, the, the factors you list, uh, did they just be? So what I just said has been true since Athens. Right. Uh, and we could sit here for hours and talk about various points in American history where these forces were unleashed. Uh, xenophobia being mostly of the late 19th century uh, and, and forward. But the Alien and Sedition Acts or the 1790s uh, about controlling the press, about uh, giving a president the power to deport foreigners by fiat. Um, so these forces have been with us for a long time. People like me, and I, or, let me just, I won't, I won't throw people, I won't pull anybody else into it. I believed that this was a difference of degree, not kind. I thought that Trump was a difference of degree, not kind. That he was the fullest manifestation of these darker impulses that we had managed to force into ebbing rather than flowing at various points in our history. And that the counterintuitive nature of democracy had managed to prevail at each point. I'm not so sure of that now, and I know you're not either. Uh, so give us kind of your democratic theory and what do you see as possible sources of resilience? Well, I, first of all, I, I agree with the premise uh, that it's a counterintuitive idea. Uh, it's less counterintuitive for us than I think it was for the founders who had every reason to be skeptical, but yet took that uh, leap of faith uh, 
Uh, but I, uh, I think that uh, Donald Trump was a supremely talented arsonist uh, at a time when the world was filled with kindling. Um, and it, it wasn't just the global situation with the economy. It wasn't just the information revolution. Uh, also, you add to that a pandemic in which conspiracy theories tend to proliferate. Um, but even through it all, um, I, I never lost hope. I don't lose hope now. Uh, and, and even in the midst of losing the trial in the Senate, um, I found myself optimistic, and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, most people, I think, that watched the proceedings may have been under the impression that when the senators came uh, back to the chamber to deliver their verdicts, it was a bit like a criminal uh, trial when the judge calls the jury back in and you wait uh, for a slip of paper to, to tell what the verdict's going to be. Actually, there were about three days that separated the end of closing arguments uh, and the, the actual vote to convict or acquit. Uh, and in those three days, senators, often to an empty chamber, uh, came uh, onto the Senate floor and delivered their verdict uh, and explained uh, their thinking. And by the time Mitt Romney uh, delivered his verdict in that form, um, all of the other senators who were at all in doubt had already uh, made their intentions very clear. I didn't know what Mitt Romney was going to do. Um, and I was in the House cloakroom, which is this little room off the House floor, uh, alone uh, and watching the television because I was told that Mitt Romney was going to speak soon. And when, uh, when he approached uh, his place uh, in the Senate chamber, um, I, one of my staff stuck his head in the cloakroom door and said, I'm hearing he's going to convict. Um, and I didn't believe him. Uh, I mean, I had heard so many things over the, over the few years that preceded it to be just really skeptical of anything that seemed positive. Um, and as Romney began his oration, um, which was very condemnatory of the president, I kept waiting for the inevitable but. Um, and then it became clear it wasn't coming. Uh, and he was voting to convict the first senator in history to vote to convict someone of his own party. And um, he got very emotional in talking about his faith uh, and in talking about his children and his grandchildren and listening to, to this you know, very decent man um, acknowledge that he was going to in, you know, incur a world of pain for what he was about to do, but he was going to do it anyway. And even if it meant he was just a footnote in history, uh, that in, in the greatest country on earth, that should be enough for any citizen. It was such a, a beautiful and honest uh, and heartfelt um, and courageous uh, act of faith that I remember thinking, you know, the founders were right to believe that people possess sufficient virtue to be self-governing, that we didn't need to be ruled by a despot. Um, and I, and I, I believe that still, um, I, I have every confidence we're gonna get through this. Um, sometimes when you're in the midst of crisis, it's hard to see how it ends or even if it ends, but this will end. Uh, and so I, I'm in the in the camp that you were in and, and may not still be in of thinking this is an aberration. Um, and, uh, you know, like the, the period of McCarthy um, was an aberration uh, and and that we move forward. Uh, so uh, I, I find myself still optimistic. It'd be hard for me to get up in the morning if yeah. I wasn't. Tell us about January 6th. Where were you? Uh, walk us through that day. Uh, about six months before the election, I had suggested to the speaker that we form a rump group of members to try to anticipate all that could go wrong uh, on election day and the aftermath. And she thought it was a good idea. And about four of us uh, came together to meet, you know, once a week or once a month uh, to kind of brainstorm um, on what could happen. What if the Electoral College were tied? What if the vice president refused to accept the slate of electors? What if a state sent two electors uh, you know, when did the denominator uh, change in terms of uh, the counting and, and uh, we consulted with outside attorneys? We thought we anticipated everything, except, of course, what happened. Um, we did not anticipate a bloody insurrection. But when the day finally came uh, for that joint session, a lot of the questions that we had wrestled with had already been answered. There were still a few outstanding, like what would Mike Pence do? Um, but... Uh, I was uh, managing, uh, along with those three colleagues, the debate 
on the floor uh, trying to respond to the efforts to decertify the election. And so I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on outside the chamber. And the first inkling I had that something was really wrong was I looked up for my notes and I saw that the speaker was gone. And I thought, that's odd because I knew that she had intended to preside the entire time. And then almost immediately two Capitol Police rushed onto the floor, grabbed our number two, Steny Hoyer, and whisked him off the floor. And I remember thinking to myself, I've never seen Steny move that fast. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so soon there were increasingly severe warnings from the Capitol Police. There were rioters in the building. We needed to get out our gas masks. We may need to get down on the ground. And then finally, as the doors were being hammered and glass was shattering, we needed to get out. Um, and I hung back um, in part because there was now a real uh, log jam to get out the doors and I didn't want to add to that scrum, um, in part because a lot of my Republican colleagues uh, were not wearing masks and it was early in the pandemic and I didn't want to be you know, uh, shoulder to shoulder um, uh, trying to get out. Um, I also felt reasonably calm for whatever reason and uh, maybe it was disbelief of what was really happening. But I had a couple of Republicans come up to me and say, um, you need to get out. Uh, you can't let people see you. Um, I know these people, I can talk to these people. You're in a completely different situation. And at first I was you know, very touched by their evident concern, but uh, that feeling soon gave way to another that, that if they hadn't been lying about the election, uh, I wouldn't need to be worried about my security. None of us would need to be. Um, and uh, I ended up walking out with a Republican member I didn't recognize. And I asked him how long he had been in Congress. And his answer really startled me. He said, 72 hours. And I said, what? And he said, I was just elected. And he was, called, he was carrying this wooden post uh, that had hand sanitizer attached to it. It was, it was uh, uh, something that had been erected at the entrances to the house floor so people could clean their hands. And he, was, he had ripped it out of the floor and he was holding this post to use it as a club to defend himself. And um, I, I said, are you really that, that worried? And he said, I think I just heard gunshots. And uh, I think that was when Ashley Babbitt was, was killed. Um, and I didn't know what to say to him. And I looked at him and I said, uh, jokingly, uh, it's not always like this. Um, and, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, tragically, um, it is still a lot like that. Um, even after we saw to what end uh, that lie brought us and that last uh, president brought us, um, they're still pushing the same line. Uh, the number two Republican in the House last Sunday uh, was asked repeatedly, can you just say the election wasn't stolen and couldn't bring himself to do it? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, if we, if we don't believe that elections can decide fairly who governs anymore, then it really does open it to political violence. Mm -hmm. Does Mike Pence, in your view, uh, fall in the Romney category, given what he did and what we now know about the pressure from the president? No. Um, for four years, he uh, acquiesced in every, every uh, immorality of the president, um, and so that he could position himself to run for that job one day. Um, the fact that he did the bare minimum, which was nonetheless very important, but the bare minimum of uh, not transgressing the Constitution and, uh, and refusing to count the electors, uh, I don't give him that much credit for merely doing the, the basic minimum of his job. Uh, and even now, he is out downplaying the significance of that insurrection, even when they were trying to hang him. Uh, he is downplaying the significance of what took place. So no, I, I don't. Um, there are a lot of other heroic people though. Uh, Dan Coates was the head of the intelligence community. Um, he refused to uh, change the facts to suit the president's preferred narrative about Russia or North Korea, North Korea, knowing that it might cost him his job and it did. Um, and uh, you know, others too. Um, uh, Marie Ivanovich, courageous ambassador to Ukraine, um, defied the president and testified, paving the way for others uh, to show the same courage. 
And, and those examples are really what, what give me uh, a lot of optimism about the future. Hmm. Talk about your, uh, the speech that I think, uh, I won't say it's going to define your public service, but it's certainly going to be a big part of it. Uh, it continues to be a kind of um, uh, touchstone for uh, people who share your concerns about the, the constitutional threat. Uh, but that closing argument, um, you were clearly aware of the moment, you discuss it in the, in the book, but what did it feel like to basically tell the United States Senate that their very, the DNA of their institution was at risk? The Senate is a, a very small place. Um, and I, I remember vividly the feeling of stepping into the Senate for the first time in many years. I had actually tried an impeachment case 10 years earlier against a federal judge. So it, it was, um, but nonetheless, it had been a long time. And I was struck immediately by how intimate it is. You can see every senator's face, you can see whether they're paying attention, whether they're moved, whether they're bored. Um, and I was, you know, each day I would try to give a kind of a closing argument about what, what was notable that came out that day. And I think the one that you're referring to is one uh, in which um, one of my staff approached me before I was gonna make the final close of the day to tell me, grab my arm and he told me, they think you've proven him guilty. Um, they need to know why he should be removed. And it, it struck me, um, you know, like a, like a, 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 a bolt of electricity um, because I, you know, the senators were out, you know, during breaks telling the press that they believed the president's defense. And here I was being told reliably because we had some very good intelligence um, that, that often came through Senator Schumer's staff about what they were hearing from Republicans. Here I was being told that uh, no, what, they, what the Republicans have been telling the press was all wrong. They understood how guilty the president was. They just needed to be convinced why he should be removed, uh, which, which meant by implication that they accepted the fact that the president of the United States withheld hundreds of millions of dollars from the ally at war in order to coerce that ally into helping him cheat in the election. And that wasn't enough. Um, and I, I suddenly realized that um, what I needed to speak to wasn't, you know, his literal guilt on what he was charged with, but rather something bigger. Um, why his continued presence in that office would pose a danger to the country. And, um, and I, had, uh, I had been so moved during the House hearings when I had listened to Alexander Vindman um, discuss why he felt comfortable telling his father, this Ukrainian immigrant, um, why he shouldn't worry about his son standing up to the most powerful man in the world, um, because here right matters. And, uh, and I remember being so struck with it because it, 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 there was a certain uh, innocence to Alexander Vindman, which I wasn't expecting from this, you know, decorated purple heart. Um, mm -hmm. But he said it like a prayer. And when, when I played that video in the Senate, um, I remember the reaction it got. And I remember, you know, Tim Kaine in particular had tears in his eyes. He was that moved just from seeing a tape of it. And, and I realized if, if those words had such power with me and with others, that that was really, that was really the heart of what we were talking about. And, and so I made the argument to the Senate that, that Donald Trump was, was fundamentally indecent, fundamentally untruthful, that he couldn't tell right from wrong. Uh, and I, I didn't uh, ask them to, to remove him because, um, because he was indecent, but because the senators were decent, uh, because right mattered to them. Mm -hmm. And and, and I, I, I concluded by saying, because if right doesn't matter, then we're lost. And, and indeed, you know, that, that is, has been my sort of conclusion from all of this, which is there's no problem in the drafting of the Constitution. There's no need to change the remedy of impeachment. We don't want to make it a majority vote and turn it into a parliament. Mm -hmm. But it all presupposes that we live up to our oath, that we, we, um, 
inform uh, how we take that oath with ideas of right and wrong, uh, that we apply the truth and principles of civility and decency. And, and if we don't, then none of it works. Um, but that's that's how that argument came about. And uh, um, I, you know, my staff uh, would always tell me that I did better when I didn't have uh, something written out for me in advance. Um, and that, that may be true, but it's really risky because, uh, you know, you never know uh, if you're going to say the right thing or the really wrong thing. Right, right. I find the hardest thing in public speaking is to try to do both. <laughs> to have a text and then try to riff is, is just, a, it's almost like the odyssey. You get sucked into some mythological <laughs> hell. <laughs> But it, it, was an, it was a brilliant performance. Uh, and I say that without acting as if it were theatrical, but, but it was in fact a lawyerly and principled creed of core. And the core was the heart of a constitutional democracy that is inherently fragile. And I think that I suspect that part of the remarkable reaction to your book is people understanding that there was a dark and difficult passage, but not really being sure it's passed. And so I want to ask everybody to, if you have questions, uh, shoot them to the Q&A uh, queue so that I can uh, uh, make it as easy technologically as possible. And we'll get to those in a second. But Talk, talk to us about the next three years, the next four years. Uh, I don't, I personally don't think there's any doubt in the world that if he's, if he's able that Donald Trump will run. I don't see why on earth he wouldn't, he wouldn't. People say, oh, well, he doesn't want to lose. Well, if he loses, he'll say it's stolen. So what, you know, what, what are you, that, that, that's not a dispositive argument to me. But uh, if you would talk about Trump, and, and that, that threat, but also what I think a lot of us think of as the franchise model. That is, are there potential successors to this movement? And it is a movement. It's taken over the Republican Party almost entirely. Um, do you worry about the next decade as well as the next half decade? Yeah. Well, I, I think you were right, first of all, that he is going to run indeed. I think he's running already. Uh, I say that because I think that it would be intolerable to him um, to contemplate anyone else getting all that attention. Yeah. Uh, the idea that Mike Pence would be the nominee or Nikki Haley or DeSantis or any of these people um, would be excruciating for him to watch. And so I think pathologically he's not capable of not running. Uh, so he's going to run. And I think given the grip he has on that party, he's going to be the nominee. Uh, and so uh, for those in my party, I think we just need to take that as uh, accepted um, and, and not underestimate him as we did uh, in 2016. Um, in terms of uh, what if he did ride off into the sunset or what if we're successful in defeating him, um, does this go on? Um, I'm optimistic there. There will be imitators, as you say, there already are. But, uh, you know, to give credit where credit is due, um, he's a uniquely talented grifter. Um, and I don't think these other pretenders to the throne have his talent for grift. Uh, you know, it, it really, you know, you got to take off your hat uh, at a certain level uh, and consider that here's a guy who campaigns for president on a platform of building a wall that Mexico is going to pay for. An absurd idea to begin with, absurd on its face. Uh, he becomes president, of course, Mexico doesn't pay for a wall. A wall doesn't get built. Um, some, of it, some of his cronies, including one who was recently held in criminal contempt, decide they're gonna raise money from Trump supporters to build the wall, and they do, and then they steal it. Uh, and then Donald Trump's pardons Bannon for stealing money from his own people. Uh, and he's still the undeniable nominee of that party. That's 
a really, really talented grifter. Uh, I'm not sure anyone could do it quite so well. Uh, so I, I, I am optimist, optimistic that when he passes from the political scene, it will be much harder to replicate uh, whatever it is that, that has given him such a grip on people. Um, but until that time comes, uh, we're gonna be dealing with all of his bio and all of his division uh, and all of the new and inventive ways um, that he will get up in the morning determined to cause grief and consternation. I mean, the man couldn't even allow Colin Powell to rest at peace for a single day. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that, that I, I have to say, I um, really gnaws at me, um, is that after that insurrection, after my Republican colleagues saw to what ends he had brought the country, there was a moment when they considered casting him aside. Uh, and I think for Kevin McCarthy, that moment of conscience, if that's what it was, lasted about 30 seconds. But yeah. you could really see Mitch McConnell wrestling with it. And, um, and I think when he decided two weeks after blaming Trump for the insurrection, that if he were nominated again, he would absolutely support him. I think when he made that decision, we lost the chance as a country to move forward. Uh, and now we're going to have to endure this trial uh, for another few years until Trump is finally repudiated. Um, and, and finally, I'll say that when more time passes, uh, I don't think there's gonna be any question about how history is gonna judge this pe period. I think they will be damning of him, uh, but I also think they will be damning of a lot of the people I serve with who enabled him uh, and did so knowing uh, what they were doing was tearing at the fabric of our democracy. Yeah. As somebody who's just in the stands watching this, uh, tell me if you think this is right. It seems to me on these points, Liz Cheney's primary is really important because otherwise there's no evidence electorally that standing up is incentivized. I think you're right. Um, I think that uh, I would like to believe that Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger represent the future of the Republican Party. Uh, when the party returns to being a party of conservative ideology and ideas. Um, the question is, is that a near future or a distant future? Um, and, you know, the, the near term political challenges they face will tell us a lot about um, how long it will take for the Republican Party to become a, a party of ideas and, and not a cult around the former president. Uh, our system really uh, depends upon at least two functional parties. Uh, and right now, uh, I think we only have one. Uh, sadly, under Trump, the Republican Party has become an, uh, an anti-democratic party and, and an anti-truth party. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so I, I really uh, admire the courage that Liz Cheney is demonstrating and, and Adam Kinzinger. Um, it is so telling in microcosm um, that Liz Cheney said she would not carry the big line. Um, and she was willing to give up her position if that's what it required. And Elise Stefanik said, well, I'm more than willing. Um, and, and, and in that illustration, you got to see what Liz Cheney was made of and you got to see what Elise Stefanik was made of and it wasn't the same stuff. Yep. Very good. Let me add a couple of questions from the folks and then uh, we'll see how the Dodgers are doing. Um, <laughs> uh, what can the everyday person do every day and not just on voting day to fight for democracy? Well, it's a great question. And uh, I think the most debilitating thing for people is to feel powerless to affect uh, their circumstances or what the country is going through. And, and the reality is that none of us are powerless. Um, you know, we can't all be Marie Ivanovich uh, first through the breach, but I think we can all figure out uh, in our own sphere, in our own circle, um, what we can do at a time when the democracy really depends on us. Um, you know, John, I, I, I'm so admiring of you in so many ways, your, your brilliance, your craft, your writing, your knowledge of history, but I also admire that you, you were not willing to remain silent. Um, during this period. And it would have been very easy for you, indeed, most of your colleagues 
um, would rather not risk alienating any of their readers. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, each of us, I think, in our private life have to make very similar decisions. They're not all as, as weighty uh, as the one you made. Um, but, uh, you know, whether it's uh, confronting uh, things that we see wrong in our own workplace or our neighborhood, um, whether it's uh, getting involved online to help some of these efforts, like what Stacey Abrams is doing, uh, to fight back against efforts to disenfranchise people of color, uh, lawyers who are donating their legal skills to protect the franchise. Um, you know, what I suggest to people, because it's not the same for every person, don't try to do everything. Mm -hmm. Just try to figure out the one thing you can do. Um, and and uh, it's empowering. Um, just focusing on the one thing you can do. Um, uh, if I uh, uh, worried about all the things going wrong, uh, instead of focusing on the things that I could try to do right, um, I would be paralyzed. And, uh, and so I think there's a role for all of us right now. No, I agree totally. And thank you for your kind words. I, I will say um, in no way was what I, my actions uh, commensurate with, with those genuine her heroic people who, who fight all the time. I'm a boringly heterosexual white Southern male Episcopalian. Things work out for me. In <laughs> but I will say this. Uh, I don't know. I was born in 1969. So I don't know where I would have been on civil rights. I do know that if everybody of my age had actually been on the right side, hypothetically, then we wouldn't have had all the problems. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. But I do know now. And I do believe the Constitution's at risk. Uh, and I'm a big believer, and I, th I think this has some hopefully resonance for, for all of us because we're all incredibly, I think, incredibly fortunate, I know you believe this, to be in this country. And as we're taught, to whom much is given, much is expected. And so if not now, when is the question? I think this is, you and I have talked about this before, this is democracy's hour of maximum danger, certainly since Fort Sumter. And the Confederates didn't get into the Capitol during the Civil War, but they did on January 6th. And so in some ways, it's even more advanced. And I think it's, um, it's tempting for people like me, uh, who kind of weaponized being a dork, uh, to want to say, well, you know, it was McCarthy, or it was the Second Klan, or you know, the fever breaks. I know President Obama has said this. Uh, I know privately, I suspect publicly that he thought the fever would break. Well, it hasn't broken yet. Yeah. And as you say, it's really remarkable. I was watching President Biden before we met tonight. And as he put it in a 50-50 Senate, let me tell you, you've got 50 presidents. What's so interesting is he didn't have any occasion to say, you've got 60 or you've got 65. That is that there, there weren't there aren't a dozen senators, you know, you, you have the scars to show for this. There aren't a dozen senators on the other side who have any even possibility of crossing the aisle. They did vote for the infrastructure bill. I think one of the great achievements of, of, the, of Biden's presidency so far, and nobody paid much attention to it, is he got 68 votes for a bill. Yeah. Which is like getting 120 in the old days. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a remarkable thing. But I, I, th I, I think what you just said is really important, which is to find the one thing. Um, and maybe it's just feeding somebody who's hungry uh, and, and acts, acts, of, acts of character are also acts of citizenship in a democracy because it is in fact the fullest expression of all of us. I'll stop preaching, one more question. Um, can I get an amen? Um, <laughs> Amen. Uh, uh, Judy asked, uh, how can we fix things so that the few like Manchin, Cinema, McCon McConnell don't have so much power and influence? Yeah. Well, you know, th this uh, may not be a very satisfying answer, uh, but it gets to the point, John, you were making about Biden's comments about the 50-50 Senate. Um, we can add a couple more Democratic senators um, and get rid of the filibuster. Uh, 
you know, I, there was probably a time many years ago where I would have been more sympathetic to the filibuster rule. Um, uh, most people got to know me over the last four years uh, and have one impression of me as this ardent partisan. Um, prior to Trump, most of the criticism I got was for working too much across the aisle. Um, and I don't consider myself a partisan. Uh, I do consider myself to be very much uh, against Trump and Trumpism. Um, but, uh, but I think the, the reality is that in a majority that is essentially split down the middle, um, then uh, one or two people um, who are willing to hold up the work of all the rest can succeed in doing it. And the only, uh, the only answer to that is to elect a couple more uh, and do away with the archaic rule that prevents the majority from getting its work done. Uh, and and you know, this raises a broader point that I, I also make in the book, which is so much of uh, the way our government works right now is anti-majoritarian. Um, in the House, when we have a gerrymander, a minority of Americans generally control the House. Mm -hmm. um, in the Senate, where 23% of the American people control 60% of the votes, it's a minority-based institution. You layer the filibuster on top of that, and it's minority rule on top of minority rule. Uh, with the Electoral College, the presidency is often occupied by someone who lost the popular vote by millions of people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Supreme Court is the least representative institution of them all now. Um, and, and I think it's fair to ask, how long can a democracy survive? Certainly, how, how long could one um, thrive uh, if a majority of the people don't control uh, the direction of the country? Uh, and so I think the, the midterm plan, uh, and here I'm not referring to the midterms, but the midterm plan, if we can't get HR1 and, and the voting rights legislation passed now to eliminate the gerrymander and uh, attack these voter suppression efforts has to be um, getting rid of the gerrymander. Uh, I would like to see us admit the, the District of Columbia into the union. Uh, and as John can, can tell you all better than I can, there's a long tradition of admitting states for the purpose of changing the balance in the Senate, sure. including splitting the Dakotas. Um, but uh, uh, in its own right, DC deserves to be a state um, and Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico so chooses. Uh, and we need to finish that multi-state compact uh, that would effectively do away with the Electoral College by states committing that whoever gets the popular vote nationally will earn all of the electoral votes from their state. Um, those are, I think, some of the most important um, midterm uh, structural changes that we need to bring about. So interesting. Um, a final thought. Um, tell us what you hope people will uh, come away from the book with? I hope people will get a sense uh, both of how fragile the democracy is, um, how, uh, you know, we, we grew up in the post-World War II era um, with the expectation that freedom was ever increasing and more people lived in, in societies with a free press and able to associate with whom they would or love whom they would. And we thought that this was somehow an immutable law of nature. Well, there's nothing immutable about it. Um, and uh, I think the farther we get from um, the, the memories of fascism, uh, the more we begin to question whether democracy is the right model. Um, so it's a fragile thing. And, uh, but I also want people to, to take away that um, we're gonna get through this. And we're going to get through this because the the number of people in America who love and honor and cherish our democracy vastly outnumber those who at this moment in history want to tear it down. Um, so I, I'm betting on the, the future of America. Great. Mr. Chairman, an honor to be with you. Thank you. Uh, the book is Midnight in Washington. Read, buy often. Uh, and uh, I love uh if you're already getting word of mouth, it's you're you're golden. <laughs> it's perfect. Uh, Rick will tell you that is that's that's where you want to be. Is uh, people say, anyone in in this media climate, someone in Chairman Schiff's position can kind of get some astroturf attention. Uh, what really is interesting, I always call it the day four problem. 
That is somebody might go out and get it because they saw you on something. It's the person who then looks at it, reads it and says, hey, you got to read this. And that's the important balance. I think you're already there. So thank you, Rick. I'll hand it back over. Thank, thank you, John. And I'll, I'll just say that's exactly what I think what is happening with um, the book. I'll hold up the copy, which those many of you in attendance are getting copies. We actually have signed copies um, that the congressman signed. So not he didn't come in. We he, was, he lives he, in D.C. He's pretty close to the warehouse where they with the books. However, they got to him. Um, they're signed. Um, both of you, this has been a, 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 a totally energizing and and kind of, you know riveting conversation and. Thank you both um, for your part in it. And uh, certainly, uh, Mr. Congressman, thank you for again for the book, for the time you've given it tonight uh, to us and um, and for the work you have done and are continuing to do. And I think you're, it's helping instill uh, the, the, the need to pay, keep paying attention to where things are, where they're going. Um, and and again, the, the, what it takes to read a, write a book and read it um, is part of all this too, to, to know the ground we're standing on. And to say something really important, I'll just point out we're in the bottom of the fifth. I will share nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, but, and, and is that the uh, the bottom of the fifth of the country or in the game tonight? I leave that to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who weren't here at the beginning, there's uh, there's a certain Los Angeles Dodger game being. Um, followed. <laughs> I, th I think I think that's it. Correct. That's, just Correct. so you know, just so you know, uh, those who did weren't here at the beginning. Thank you both, gentlemen, and um, you know, you're actually it's late for both of you in, in terms of the night. So we thank you and thank you those of us who joined us. We, there is a recording for this if you missed some of this because I know some of you um, weren't here at the beginning. So you will get to see and hear all. Thank you again and take care. Um, Godspeed both and good luck with everything.